Okay, confession time. I have no idea what a light worker is. I really have no substantive education or background in the path of the light worker, so I'm really going to just be making up my own definitions and working with the term light worker within the universe of Bell and within the personal noses of Bell. So there's that. I want to make clear that the title of light worker and those who truly are light workers are people I hold in the absolute highest of regard, and I, I believe that this video ultimately demonstrates that quite clearly. I only wish I could do what light workers do. I only wish I could do half of the work that they are able to contribute to this world. What this video is critical of are those who call themselves light workers, but are they really? I find that people who refer to themselves or self-identify as light workers are people who are looking for deeper meaning in their lives. They need their lives to mean something and want to push forth a greater good, and this need becomes a lifelong calling for them. It's such an intense emotional pull for them, this need to do a greater good. The light worker is someone who seeks personal validation through people saying to them, you've changed my life for the better. You are a positive influence. You have a positive impact. You are a champion of goodness, whatever that means. They want their identity to be centered on that mission of positivity, of goodness, of being a positive and constructive influence or force in this world. So they attach themselves to a special title called the light worker. Before you misinterpret my title, Tone, I am all for that, like 300%. I am unequivocally behind the mission of positive influence, positive impact, and being a champion of goodness, again, whatever that word means. But I'm just wondering whether we're all starting with the same definition and understanding of what light worker even is. For example, do I consider myself a light worker? I think inside, a latent inner drive of mine is absolutely in line with the so-called light worker. I have to acknowledge that, yes, I do seek personal validation through people saying to me things like, you've made my life better and you're a positive influence, champion of goodness, blah, blah, blah. I absolutely seek that. That, that brings me a sense of validation. I do make decisions based on what will position me as someone who will have a positive influence, a positive impact, who can be a champion of goodness. Why? Why do I want to position myself in that way? Because I want people to think I am good. I want people to think I am a good person. I think at the heart of all, I want to be a good person. Here's the thing, excluding sociopaths, don't we all? Doesn't everybody want to be a good person and make decisions to position themselves as a positive influence, a champion of goodness? So then isn't everybody by this definition a light worker? If almost everybody is by this definition a light worker, then does the term even hold any real value for us? Is there an unbearable lightness of being to the term light worker? Or does light worker mean something else that I'm just not totally getting and I'm probably ignorant of? I think then another question is, what does good mean and how do we perceive positive influence? Do all light workers agree unanimously on the definition of good and positive influence? Or are there disagreeing political factions among light workers? I'm not being supercilious. This is actually a very sincere question. Growing up immersed in Mahayana Buddhism, I've always been more fascinated with bodhisattvas, bu uh, pusa, than Buddhas. For so overgeneralizing here, Buddhas are enlightened beings that then become independent consciousness, a light in the world, free-thinking godhead. And some Buddhas seek to be a light to teach, to guide, to heal, to help. But they do all of that from their paradise, their respective Buddha worlds. If you're like, huh, what? It's just like a really long story. You just, you're going to have to just go with it and learn Buddhism 101 somewhere else. I'm going to move on here. Bodhisattvas, Pusa, on the other hand, are, again, oversimplifying, one step short of enlightenment, but on purpose. They've opted on their own voluntarily not to transcend. They've opted not to attain Buddhahood because they want to stay here in lower vibrational realms. And okay, in short, they want to like be in the trenches, getting themselves dirty to help out beings who probably don't deserve their help.
Kuan Yin is an example of a bodhisattva, a pusa. As the mythology goes, Kuan Yin began gendered as male, but because women weren't allowed to be in the presence of men and women weren't deemed worthy enough to prostrate before the Buddhas and gods, Kuan Yin transformed himself into a woman, a second class citizen, so that those who are gendered female can now morally be in the presence of women and lowly enough to be among women. So Kuan Yin is low enough to be among women who were, of course, like I said, second class citizens. Actually, we weren't even really citizens. We were just property. So there is this theme of transgenderism, but also feminism woven into the Kuan Yin mythos. Feminism, because here was a bodhisattva who basically said, oh, hey, look, women are people too. We ought to bring the teachings and pathworking of enlightenment to the ladies as well as the men. Kuan Yin's bodhisattva vow is to not transcend to Buddhahood until every last mortal here on earth achieves Buddhahood too. So Kuan Yin would in effect be the last one off this sinking ship. If you think about the cultural and historic context, Kuan Yin tackled some really tough, controversial social issues. I mean, here was someone not afraid of controversy, not afraid of political backlash. Just you name the most uncomfortable topic you can think of, and Kuan Yin was like, I am going to be a lover and champion of the marginalized, the ostracized, and the castaways of society. For example, the elderly have a special place in Kuan Yin's heart. She protects and safeguards those in their, in their old age. There's also this myth involving Kuan Yin embodying a human female form, a princess that always gets the waterworks out of me. Uh, sidebar, Kuan Yin consciousness can embody any manifestation as needed to spread the word of peace, mercy, sacrifice, and compassion. Okay, here goes. Let's see if I can tell you the whole story without crying or, or uh, you know, resorting to waterworks. A king was disappointed in the birth of a daughter, of course, he wanted a son, then disappointed that this daughter had no materialistic ambitions and instead just wanted to, you know, be all love and light, help the poor, feed the hungry, cure the sick, you know, all that useless, boring, crazy stuff. The daughter, this princess, then wanted to become a nun. The king was like, hell no, the daughter insisted. So finally, the king's like, okay, yeah, but, but, he ordered all of the nuns at the monastery to treat his daughter, the princess, like shit, and to abuse her, hoping that by abusing her, she would see that Buddhism was wrong and return to the palace. So the nuns abused her the entire time she was at this monastery as a nun. Then the king came down with, these, with this obscure illness and required medicine made out of the pulverized eyeballs and arms of someone pure of heart. So he asked a whole bunch of people, including all of his family members, his, his uh, sons, wives, daughters, concubines, you know, all the people who allegedly love him the most, to do this for him. And all of them were like, hell no. Somehow this princess, now a nun, got wind of the news. Anonymously, she made the sacrifice of her eyes and arms so that this crazy-ass medicine could be prepared to save the king, her asshole father. After the king was saved, he wanted to meet this amazing person who was so willing to sacrifice eyes and arms, and he traveled to some distant place where everyone said this person was, only to discover it was the daughter he treated like shit. As if all this wasn't enough, when they meet, the daughter bows before her father and thanks him for the opportunity to demonstrate her love and gratitude to him for being her father and giving her life. Like, what the fuck? This is supposed to be a good story? Fortunately, happy ending. She sheds her physical body and reveals herself to be Kuan Yin, or okay, getting a bit into esoteric Buddhism here, the princess herself actualizes Kuan Yin consciousness at that moment. This is kind of hard to explain. She reunites with that Kuan Yin consciousness. She becomes Kuan Yin, becomes one with... It's kind of like that whole Catholic father, son, Holy Spirit stuff, except it's Kuan Yin. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, don't ask. Anyway, that princess, a bona fide light worker. If you embody even a fraction of that philosophy of life, then fine, you're definitely a light worker. Me, personally, I would have given that horde king father guy the middle finger, so I'm not a light worker. 
In these scriptures, you read about Kuan Yin. She's also about showing mercy to prisoners who the rest of mainstream society have deemed unworthy of mercy. She's about genuinely loving your enemy, your worst enemy. And guys, to truly love your worst enemy, you can't talk passive aggressive shit about them the way you see so many 21st century so called light workers doing. Shh, no names, but we're moving on. Kuan Yin and Kuan Yin consciousness is about forgiving the unforgivable. Weirdly, there is almost a sense of injustice to what she's about, meaning she isn't about reaping what you sow, but she is about love and light for everyone, whether or not you karmically deserve it. If you're asking me, that's some serious, no-nonsense, hardcore lightworking. And if I'm to chime in, that's just not what I see from modern New Age lightworkers. Another bodhisattva is Di Zhang Wang Pusa. I actually had to Google what his name is in English, and apparently it's Earth Womb or Earth Matrix, which I, I just can't really say with a straight face. So I'm just going to continue speaking Chinese at you and just call him Di Zhang Wang Pusa. Again, the Bodhisattva Di Zhang Wang, we have a theme of transgenderism. As a mortal or human being, Di Zhang Wang was a female, a maiden. Then somehow as a Buddhist monk, she became a he, and then he became a Bodhisattva, a Pusa, and as a Bodhisattva is gendered male, a he. Di Zhang Wang's Bodhisattva vow is not to ascend Buddhahood until all hells are emptied. His mission is to, in effect, help demons and hungry ghosts, believe it or not, reform and achieve Buddhahood. As the mythology goes, he spends most of his time in hell, traversing the dangerous terrains of hell, suffering in hell, suffering the same things that the other demons and hungry ghosts and souls are suffering in hell alongside of them. He lowers his vibrations intentionally so that he can be among the hell beings and he can traverse among hell. Again, that is some serious, hardcore light working, being willing to suffer hell just so that you can be there to save the souls in hell. Maybe I don't know what lightworking means. Maybe I'm like the tiger mom and my expectations or standards of what lightworking should be is too high. I, I don't know. But if you're not intentionally putting yourself in the line of fire, subjecting yourself to danger and threat and dark forces just so you can be where the dark forces are, where they congregate so you can bring light to the dark, if you're not suffering alongside the suffering, I just feel like you haven't really earned the title of lightworker. If you truly want to have your life bear meaning and to really have that positive impact that you seek for personal validation, you can't be a light among the light. You have to be a light among darkness. So the light worker has to always dwell in what is the darkest, most lower vibrational realms that we have. In that almost weird paradoxical sense, lightworking isn't about the upper chakras. Lightworking is about your lower chakras. It's about not spending all of your time among people who are seeking their higher purpose or at the top pyramid, of, uh, at the top of the Maslow's pyramid. They're not talking to spirit guides and about their higher selves. It's about spending all of your time among those who are fighting for survival, who are dealing with abuse, addiction, trauma, exploitation, marginalization, who are desperately trying to fight off their own inner demons. A light worker isn't somebody who helps you connect with archangels to talk about how much you're loved by this universe. And if you just utter these five affirmations and mantras daily, then you too can manifest wealth, abundance, success, and happiness. That's not a light worker. That's, that's something else, but that's not a light worker. A light worker is someone I'll never be. A light worker is the social justice lawyer making no money at all, advocating for prisoners' rights, the doctor or nurse advocating for universal health care. A light worker is somebody taking money out of her own pocket to feed the hungry or house the homeless. Public school teachers in the inner cities are light workers. Jesus was a light worker. A light worker is someone working with those suffering from abuse, PTSD, mental illness, someone engaging with the lowest caste or social classes of every society.
a light worker doesn't care who deserves it. A light worker just helps anyone who needs help. Period. Light working cannot hinge on meritocracy. Light working cannot be determined by what you are or are not willing to do. It's about what has to be done to care for everybody, to make sure everybody is cared for unconditionally. Light working is compassion, mercy, and unconditional love. Unconditional. Light working cannot hinge on meritocracy. If you're just talking out of your ass about love and light and not personally going where the darkness is, suffering alongside the suffering, if you're not face to face every day with danger, with people who have been through hell and back, then I'm sorry, you're not a light worker. So who is a light worker? Are you a light worker? You're a light worker when you've made it your mission in life to champion for the disadvantaged. You're a light worker when you don't avoid feeling pain just because, you know, it's painful. You're not scared of the darkness. You're happy to associate yourself and be seen associating with the lowest caste members of society, the people that society has in fact condemned. You take on the most difficult work, the work that has personal repercussions, the work that nobody else will even touch because you're afraid of what other people will think. You give hope to people who the rest of society has already deemed hopeless. You see worth in people that others have already deemed worthless. When you can align yourself with these mission statements, then I would say for sure you're a light worker. The identity of a light worker isn't in how you feel about yourself. It's in what you do. It's measurable. Okay, you know the drill by now. Bell chimes in isn't about me, it's about us. So join in the discourse. Your voice needs to be heard. Tell me, tell the world. Do you agree? Or did I get something wrong? Chime in with your thoughts on who is and is not a lightworker.